All right, so this is the, the right talk, the right date, the right conference, and that is actually the right person. We got it. Um, thanks. I, I want to thank Contact and Don Scott in particular for organizing this and motivating me to put this. Pick up the mic, yeah. please. Uh, okay. Is that set for your height? Yeah, I have to just hold it. Um, so I want to start with sort of the motivational connection <laughs> to literature. This is, oh, we don't have the sound, do we? Let's go back and do that. This is pretty cool in lots of ways. First, Spock, this is episode 26, I'm sure you all remember. It's about 12 minutes after the start of the episode, original series, of course. Uh, Spock uses a tricorder to detect alien life, uh, silicon-based life, through solid rock, 100 miles away. Uh, so for me, this was motivational. And I think contact is a type of conference where those kind of connections are useful and interesting. Uh, it was also when I decided that I wasn't going to play basketball. I wanted Kirk Spock's job, not Kirk's job. <laughs> so I put away the basketball and dug out the calculus book instead. Uh, and this is, in a sense, what we're trying to do. We're searching for life, life not as we know it. We'd like to have spiffy starships and uniforms and a tricorder, uh, but we do with what we can do. Uh, oops, pushing the right button. So what are we searching for? Here, trying to turn that image that Star Trek really, at least emblazoned in my mind, into a concrete, specific question. We're trying to search for a second. Not really a definition in the sense of a, of, a, of a textbook definition, but it's an example. We know what we're looking for. We're looking for something not on the tree of life. Aliens is defined biochemically, something that's not on our tree of life. So we are not one of those retrograde federal agencies that defines aliens geographically. <laughs> we define aliens biochemically. Uh, and that's an important new insight into the whole approach over the last many years. Uh, where are we going to look? Mars, Europa, Enceladus, and Titan. Mars in particular, I want to focus on today, as you'll see in the connection <clears throat> to the Park Service. Uh, our concept of Mars is, and its history is in this one chart explanation. Mars, we think, started off uh, wetter, Earth-like. This is a painting by Michael Carroll. Uh, and because of it being smaller and that thus having no plate tectonics, less gravity, and no magnetic field, it lost its atmosphere and became cold and dry. The question we're interesting is, interested in is, did Mars have life when it was Earth-like? Because when it was Earth-like, we know life is found on Earth. So that's the framing of the question. That one image and that simple description is really the essence of why Mars is so scientifically interesting. Here is uh, the, the site of the current exploration, Curiosity, and this is when the connection to National Park starts. Because you can see in this image of Mars scenes that you would see driving through many national parks. Drive through Death Valley, drive through the Mojave Desert, you'll see scenes like this. Uh, in fact, you might expect there to be a uh, the coyote in the corner or something. Oh, yeah, there is one right up there. Um, in the corner. Uh, and uh, the banquet speaker tomorrow night, by the way, just a little plug for her, uh, was the first paper, Cabral et al., 1999, that laid out the importance of this site for astrobiology, Gail Crater. Uh, and uh, that this image is of a dry lake bed, of sedimentary rocks in the foreground, distant hills, and then haze, and then more distant hills. It really looks familiar. Uh, it really looks like places we've seen. And that's, I think, part of the reason why Mars has such a capture on our interest and on our imagination is because it looks like our Earth. It looks like us. And what could possibly be more fascinating than us, right? <laughs> so, so this takes us to the parks directly. And again, I have to thank Don Scott, who I've known since the Precambrian. And Don <laughs> was the one who got me to realize that research was part of the mandate of the parks and that they would not only not be hostile to us 
trying to work with them on research, but they would in fact be interested. Uh, it sounds kind of obvious, uh, but it was Don's efforts, I guess it was in the 80s, yeah, the 80s uh, right. that uh, he recruited me to in, in interactions with the park. And in particular, uh, Craters of the Moon. He specifically told me, you got to go to Craters of the Moon. Uh, and in fact, our first trip to Craters of the Moon, uh, we got there a couple weeks after Don had just left. <laughs> But we, as a result of, of our interaction, we've been working in four national parks on three different projects. And I, we do a lot of other work, but I want to focus just briefly on those three projects since this session is about the national parks. Uh, and that is a project on rocks in Craters of the Moon and Hawaii Volcanoes National Park. Uh, a project on extreme environments, life in extreme environments, in Death Valley National Park. And... Uh, a, another project on life and extreme environments in Lassen Volcanic National Park. Uh, so those are the three I'll, I'll just talk briefly about. In Craters of the Moon, we went there in a space we're bound expedition almost 10 years ago now, and uh, I was amazed by the beautiful lava flows called Blue Dragon. So there's a, a lava flow at Craters of the Moon that's blue, shiny blue. It's really quite beautiful. Uh, and that's nice, but it's also very interesting because uh, what we, and, this, and here it is, you can see the blue coloring on, on, the, uh, on the lava here. Oh, there's a point. You see the blue coloring? Here's Blue Dragon, this is not. And what was really curious is that we noticed for the first time, because we were not geologists, so that's a rock, it's just a rock. Uh, we were interested in the mosses and the lichens of the cyanobacteria. Uh, that the mosses and lichens and cyanobacteria didn't want to live on the blue dragon. So here's a good example of that. This is a rock that's just covered with lichens and mosses, but the, none of them are on the blue dragon. Same orientation, same microclimate, but they're not living on the blue dragon. And further examination showed that they don't live on the blue dragon only when the blue dragon points faces south. They'll live on the north-facing blue dragon, but they won't face, they won't live on the south-facing blue dragon. So the rocks are interesting, but what's much more interesting is this preference of the lichens and mosses, right? There's a story there, right? Uh, what we found, the first hypothesis we had was that somehow it's got to do with iron and titanium. It's iron, titanium oxide is known to be, uh, uh, become active, exposed to sunlight. So you might think just titanium. Uh, exposed to sunlight creates uh, radicals and organisms don't like that. And there, there would therefore be a correlation between titanium and the blueness and uh, then the sunlight would explain the orientation. Wrong. There was no correlation between titanium and orientation. This was a big letdown because we had year one of the space we're bound, we had gone out with the teachers uh, and we had discovered this serendipitously by looking around. It's amazing what you can learn by looking around. Right? That's a famous quote. If it's not by Benjamin Franklin, it should have been. Uh, it's amazing what you can learn by looking around. And so we thought, we brainstormed in the evening, what do we do? Well, we went out and got a handheld titanium and iron meter, portable x-ray fluorometer, took it to the field, measured it. I was sure, as sure as sure could be, that we would find a correlation. And we didn't. So that night, we were in the kitchen with, in the room where we're eating dinner with all the teachers, and it was raining, and I thought, well, we're wrong. What do we do next? And one of the teachers said, maybe it's not elemental, it's mineralogical. And I thought, oh, that's it. That's got to be it. So that's our new hypothesis, is that it's not due to the elemental concentrations, due to the mineralogy. That the same, and this makes sense. In retrospect, it's obvious. Everything is obvious in retrospect. <laughs> it's obvious in retrospect because the, the only hypothesis for why there's blue coloring is a particular mineralogical form of the titanium oxide that creates a energy balance uh, balances that are irradiate, irradiate in blue. And so that same electronic arrangement uh, must be responsible for producing oxidants, which is inhibiting the growth. So we took a sample and we're trying to irradiate it at the synchrotron up at Stanford so we can look at the mineralogy and we're going to eventually when we have a student, uh, the right student, we'll do experiments 
where we try to grow things on the Blue Dragon and measure oxidants. This is work in progress. Uh, and we find the Blue Dragon in other volcanic uh, parks, not as common. Here is Hawaii Volcanoes National Park, where I, I went as part of scouting out of the high seas site. And sure enough, there's little tiny bits of Blue Dragon down here, too. Right. Uh, okay, part two. Death, Death Valley. Uh, our, our research there initially focused on Badwater Basin, the lowest uh, place in the, in the northern hemisphere. Uh, it's a big salt flat, as you can see. Uh, this is uh, where the salt has been packed down. Here's the, the uh, bare salt. Uh, this is a view out over the salt flats. It's a huge salt flat. It floods every, every uh, few years, every El Nino year. Uh, and here's looking back toward the road, there's a depression in the salt flats that collects water. The water is there all year round. It's very salty. I assume this is where the name bad water came from. You don't want to drink this water. It's very salty water. There's brine shrimps and things living in it. It is so saturated with salt that its vapor pressure is low enough that it doesn't evaporate. By the way, this is a model for liquid water on Mars today, uh, but with more soluble salts for chlorates instead of chloride. What's interesting, what we found interesting here was in this packed salt <laughs> bed, where particularly where people have walked and packed down the salt, there's this fascinating layer of microorganisms growing in formation. There's a pink layer, and then a green layer, and then a black layer, and there are halo-tolerant bacteria, uh, photosynthetic bacteria below the halo-tolerant bacteria, and then uh, decomposers, and it smells like hydrogen sulfide. Uh, so we, it's a very interesting system, and uh, we were studying it with some other folks, and uh, we were going to continue working on it, but then Suzanne Douglas, who was at JPL at the time, did a series of really nice papers that sort of uh, addressed all the questions that we were interested in. So uh, we're not too active in this area anymore, but it's what brought us to Death Valley. And while we were there, we figured, why not? This is the lowest place on the continental uh, United States. Shouldn't it also be the hottest place in the continental United States, right? Uh, the hottest place on record is Furnace Creek Death Valley. But Furnace Creek Death Valley is significantly higher than Badwater in elevation, like uh, almost 200 meters. Furnace Creek is about at sea level. And this is 80 meters. Uh, let's go back to the chart. You can just read it. This is 85 meters below that. And it's out on barren ground. Furnace Creek has got trees, palm trees. If you've ever been there, you know. Right? So we thought our hypothesis was, was that we would get a better record by measuring temperature here than you get at Furnace Creek. Right? So we went down and put in a precision platinum resistance thermometer measurement station, sure that when the hot waves come, our hot would be hotter than their hot. Right? Uh, the answer is no. It's the same temperature. And here's the data, so you can believe me. This is Furnace Creek, and this is their maximum temperature. And here's our daily maximum temperature at Badwater. And you can see on the hot end, it's essentially the same. Within noise, it's the same. It's not any hotter at Badwater than it is at Furnace Creek. And this is the most common question I get from visitors when I'm standing around. I think this was a visitor. This is Heather Smith, and this is me. Uh, the most common question I get from visitors is, how much hotter is it here than over at Furnace Creek, where the official weather station? And the answer is, no hotter. Now, it is a little bit colder at night. Uh, there's a systematic uh, trend here. You can see that Furnace Creek is warmer at night than bad water. That's not that interesting. It's not that surprising. This is a big open area, radiative cooling. It's going to cool more efficiently than... Furnish Creek. So is, the, the answer was not very interesting. So I'm still trying to figure out how do I turn this into a publication, which of course, <laughs> all, which is what science is all about, right? Science isn't about understanding or about data or about advancing human knowledge. It's about getting publications. So we have to figure out how to turn this into a publication. I think I, I have some idea. I have to turn the null result into an interesting result. Uh, also, there's speaking on Death Valley, one of the other interesting sites and connections to Mars is not work that I'm directly involved in, but indirectly, that Rosabla uh, is doing, is looking at this crater, Yubihi crater, a volcanic crater, and comparing it to Gale crater uh, and Yellowknife Bay. And this is a picture taken by 
Yeah. Uh, the rover camera, and this is the picture taken by the Rosala camera. Mm. They both start with R, so there's got to be an analog. <laughs> right. uh, and Rosala, who's here, could talk, talk more about that if you're interested. Now let's go to the final part, Lassen, which is a very interesting park. It's one, it is the unappreciated jewel of the national parks, in my opinion. So go there while it's unappreciated because it's not anywhere near as crowded as any of the other parks. Uh, it's interesting because it's got a volcano, uh, and that's fun, but that's not what got us to be interested in it. What got us to be interested in is in that it is so snowy. It gets a heck of a lot of snow. As you can see, this is the road that swings around uh, Lake Helen. And this is spring, and you can see meters and meters of snow piled up around here. Uh, think of the weather today coming in. Lassen is sticking up like a snow catcher, just catching that snow and piling it up all winter. So it is one of the snowiest and persistently predictable snowiest places on Earth. So if you have a hankering for studying organisms that live in snow, like these red snow algae, Lassen is the place to go. Uh, it is the best place to see reproducibility of snow algae colonies at the same spot. You can say, come back in September and there will be red snow right here. And that's really huge in terms of studying their uh, ecology and understanding them. This is a series of pictures. We, we picked a spot, for those of you that know Lassen, just continue around that curve uh, past uh, Lake Helen, and there's a big flat area, like a big basin on the right-hand side of the road going away from Helen. That area is the snow bowl of Lassen several meters of snow every year. This is a series of pictures taken from a, a camera that we mounted in 2007. And looking at this yesterday, uh, actually wait, late last night when I prepared this talk, I was impressed at how the technology has changed. These are grainy pictures. Ten years ago, what you could do with a remote camera sitting on a spot was so much more crude than what you can do now. Uh, but anyway, this was good enough to do the job. You can see pictures uh, throughout the year, no snow, snow comes and the snow goes away. And so what we did is we found a spot where we knew there would be snow and we put in a couple meters of sensors. So the ground is bare, we put in a couple meters of sensors, then we know the snow is going to come and bury it and we can track what's going on in there. And, the, and I just pulled out the results from a paper that we did on this uh, by a grad student, Adrian Dove, and uh, what we find is that which was a surprise, is that the snow starts melting at the bottom long before uh, spring comes. So in March, uh, runoff at the bottom, there's liquid water at the bottom, uh, even though the, there's no uh, bulk drainage until April. And the liquid water starts when the snowpack is several meters deep. So the algae, which rest on the ground during the winter, summer, and then when they see water, they're triggered and then swim up through the snowpack get the water trigger in March, and there's still several meters of snow above them to get to the light. So they get the water without the light. So it's a different ecosystem than a thin snowpack, which gets the water and the light at the same time. Now that's interesting to those who are interested in it, which means those who study snow algae. But it's an interesting model for us because this is an organism that lives on ice, lives on snow. And so you can see the connections to Mars. Uh, now, Mars is great, national parks are great. Uh, it's been a lot of fun looking at doing science in those three parks and elsewhere. Now I want to go to Enceladus. As you all know, it's a small moon of Saturn with a jet of water coming out. Uh, that, that jet contains organic material, so it's not just water, it's, it's soup. Uh, we want to fly a mission through it. Uh, I used to put this on my slides, free samples. Uh, they're not exactly free. Uh, it turns out when you do the numbers, they cost a billion dollars. So I like to quote that, one of my favorite songs. It's cheap, but it's not free. Uh, so missions on Enceladus would be uh, cheap, but it's not free. So I, I'm throwing this out as what are the good analogs? What national park should I go to pretending to do research, uh, which is relevant to Enceladus, Don? Okay, uh, we'll think about and it. thinking of national parks, here's a uh, look in the future uh, poster advertising uh, Enceladus as an interesting destination. And I think it illustrates an interesting point that what humans are going to do in the solar system when they're no longer, or in addition to doing science, is going to be tourism. Mm -hmm. 
That's going to be what drives humans out into space. That's what has driven humans to Antarctica. First science, then tourism. And that'll be the case here. So pack your bags and get ready for ourselves. Thanks. Do we have time for questions? Yes, sir. We have plenty of time. We're ahead of schedule. Ahead of schedule. All right. That's good. Any comments or questions? In the back. Chris, uh, when you were looking at the, the salt flats, and you saw, I believe you saw a, uh, three, three different varieties of bacteria. The, the lower was most, I think, is the most The middle layer was supposed to be. Middle layer. How far down was it? Uh, let me go back to that because you can see it. I think I have a pen knife in there for scale. So here's a little tiny pen knife that's about. Uh, Microphone. Here's a little tiny pen knife that's about uh, three or four centimeters long. So they're about half a centimeter. Uh, the whole ecosystem extends about a the photic zone of this ecosystem extends about uh, half a centimeter. And then the black zone, the decomposition zone, extends <coughs> below that to the bottom. So, uh, so my question is, is that um, obviously the photosynthetic bacteria are getting light Yes. Uh, and Scattered light. Scattered light. Right, right. And does that, those, that scattered light, um, it's obviously of a different quality than the light. Um, do you see any differences in the type of bacteria the deeper you go that are photosynthetic due to the scattering of the light and the reduction of the energy? Yeah, that's a really good question. Uh, so the question is, these are photosynthetic bacteria and they're living underneath a material that is pretty uh, optically thick. And we see this commonly in desert ecosystems. If you're living in a desert and you need sunlight, uh, don't be on the surface because it's too harsh. Get under a rock or inside a rock. It's a common strategy for life in extreme environments. And in fact, just to put a little aside, we think it is the ultimate strategy. The most dry resistant organisms are the so-called uh, endoliths. Those are the most dry resistance. Hypoliths, which just grow under rocks, not inside them, are, are the runner-ups. Uh, and then anything exposed to the surface is a distant third. And so your question was, was if you've got to deal with light that's coming through a rock, uh, isn't that going to be a, a, an issue? Uh, let me answer it specifically here and then in general, because they're, they're both in. Specifically here, it's not much of a problem because the salt, the gypsum, and the halite are white. And so the, the light is scattered, but it's still wavelength distribution in the visible that organisms care about from 400 to 700 nanometers is about the same as it is on the surface. It's not unlike a cloudy day like today. Uh, you go outside today, it's cloudy, you can't see the sun, it's optically thick, but the quality of light at the ground is still uh, similar. Colors don't look distorted. The one exception, which is fortuitous, is that that scattering does block UV. So this, so uh, out far away from the visible, the organisms are actually protected from UV. Now there are though, not a to, to more general answer, there are hypolithics, endolithic environments where the rocks are not white. Uh, sandstones in Antarctica, uh, which are obviously tainted orange with uh, iron. Uh, in the Mojave, there's a site near Silver Lake where there's uh, uh, red rocks, heavily covered with red, which have a hypolith. And so, in fact, we did a study uh, trying to address that same question where we found four, five different types of rocks. Quartz carbonate, uh, covered carbonate, red covered, crusted carbonate, talic, and uh, quartz. Uh, maybe I said one wrong, but there's five different types of lithologies, all with the same species of cyanobacteria living under. We measured the light through them, uh, and they don't seem to care that they're slightly different light in one or the other. So. Uh, that's not the end of the story, but maybe it's the beginning of that of that story. So, Let me come back to you. Okay, yeah, you can, if it's a follow up. Yeah, follow up. That is, um, would you would you anticipate that um, as the light degrades and it's, light degrades as you get further into the rock or the salt, that you would see different species capable, different pigment spe pigmented species being able to 
And would they be in a, would they potentially be in a symbiotic relationship? You, that's, that is in fact the expectation that we've had. And you see this in some sedimentary columns. You see it in the water column in the ocean. The organisms that live on top use certain photons, and then other photons penetrate deeper, so you have different organisms deeper down. Uh, and that's seen in, in certain salt flats and in aquatic environments. And I, we haven't seen it yet in hypolithic environments, and part of the reason, I think, is the light drops off so fast that there's only room for one layer of organisms living there. Uh, it's a physical compaction problem. But this is, this is something to, that would warrant further investigation in one's infinite free time. How's your free time? <laughs> uh, question here, Bill, and then we'll yeah. just work back. Chris, on one of your earlier slides, uh, something about the uh, search for life in the universe, you, there was in low font uh, the one to infinity rule. One, two, zero, one, zero to infinity. infinity. Yeah. What, what yeah. is that? Uh, this is a well-known rule. If you Google, okay, here it is. The zero, one, infinity rule. Uh, if you Google it, you will find that computer scientists think they invented it. And it's the concept that the only three numbers that make sense are 0, 1, and infinity. But in fact, they did not invent it. Isaac Asimov invented it. As, again, this is what contact is all about. We learn from uh, literature. Uh, Isaac Asimov invented it in his book, uh, The Gods themselves. And in that book, he says, uh, he's talking about God. And he said, basically, there's either zero, one, or infinity. There's not going to be 23 gods. Uh, you know, the Greeks, as you recall, believed that there was an infinite number of gods. Every creek was a god. Every tree was, every grove was a god. They were on the infinity side. Most of us are on the zero or one side. Nobody believes in 0.5 gods or 1.3 gods, right? So that's the zero, one, infinity rule. So if we could prove, if we could prove that there was one god, we would know it went from zero to one. And if we could prove there was two, then we would know we were at infinity, okay, right? We would know the Greeks were right, as they were about most other things, right? And I put my vote on that, by the way. Uh, so. Uh, what does that got to do with the search for life? It says if we find another example of life in our solar system, we've gone to two. I assume we all accept ourselves as an example of life. That's one. We know it's not zero. We, we know it's at least one. If we can get to two, we're at infinity. So I tell my management when they say, what are you doing? I say, I'm trying to count from one to two. Bear with me. <laughs> so uh, that's why the zero, one, infinity rule is up there. And that's why I put a little yay next to that, because just finding one more example of life tells us something profound about the whole universe, right? So just finding something on Mars or Enceladus tells us something about the universe that we can't really say with confidence, even though we all believe it, until we actually have that data point. Question here? Uh, so when you were talking about things living in snow and Enceladus and the Jovian moons that are icy things with oceans, if if number two, uh, de developed uh, from like volcanic whatever, and then worked its way, the vo volcanic rifts and worked its way up into the ice. It's still, you know, uh, tens of kilometers of ice and then hard vacuum. And so sunlight is not going to penetrate. Is there a mechanism to keep critters alive to the point where we could scrape the surface and maybe find them? Uh, no, and that's a, that's a good question, which see, uh, the obvious answer, which you just alluded to, seems to be lost on NASA headquarters. Uh, if you go to, if you go to I'm this, happy to be a paid consultant. Yeah, if you go to this model, here's life on the surface. If you were to land on this ice and drill down a few centimeters, you would find evidence of life. Uh, but as you pointed out, that is not the surface of Europa or Enceladus. There is no plausible scientific argument that says you're going to find evidence for life on the surface of Europa and Enceladus. Now this is just an opinion. It's not NASA's official opinion, it's not my official opinion, it's not the, divi the division I'm in's official opinion, it's just an opinion I got off the web from opinions.com. <laughs> so, you know, I can't be held accountable for it. I am certainly not gainsaying the wisdom of NASA headquarters in advocating for a surface lander on Europa. And certainly if they 
make that an approved mission, we will propose an instrument for it. <laughs> but if you go to opinions.com, it says it's pretty a dumb idea. Right? Chris, uh, there's a recent <coughs> report out by a scientist that we have lots of phosphorus, which is essential for life, right. but that there's likely to be less phosphorus out there in the rest of the universe, and as a consequence, life elsewhere is unlikely. Candidly, I think the position is kind of chauvinistic and short-sighted, but I defer to the expert. Well, it, it's, a, it's an important point, and it goes back to the zero-one thing. We only have one example, so it makes scientific sense to at least base our initial search on that one example. So the phosphorus question is worth considering. We have direct measurements of phosphorus on Mars, so it's not that we don't know it's there. Uh, we have direct measurements of phosphorus now from Rosetta in comets. We expect there to be phosphorus in Enceladus. We have Cassini could not measure it. We expect there to be phosphorus in Enceladus because we know that this water jet is interacting with hydrothermal, so it's rocks, rocks and hot water reacting. So phosphorus should be in the mix. So I don't think that's a fundamental problem. Uh, life doesn't need much phosphorus, and it's damn good at pulling out small bits of it and uh, using it. To follow up, if I may, if meteorites and comets contain phosphorus, and if they're extrasolar, that kind of answers the question. Uh, I was with you up until the extrasolar, and then I just knock it over to Dave Morrison's talk, which is the next one. He'll talk about extrasolar. But I'm just confining my domain to the solar system. I'd be happy to find two next door, uh, and uh, number two, life number two next door. And, uh, and there we know there's phosphorus. Whether it came from extrasolar or not, obviously it must have evolved, ultimately produced in stars, right? It's not produced on planets. But question way in the back, and then we'll do this side. Yeah. Um, you mentioned earlier that plate tectonics, that Mars doesn't have plate tectonics. And I know uh, UCLA, I think, published a couple papers in 2012 about plate tectonics on Mars. And so I was wondering if you did they, if there was any. Uh, Reality to that, and more importantly, what does plate tectonics have to do with? Why does plate tectonics matter, and does Mars have plate tectonics? Uh, that's a deep question, literally. <laughs> what's going on? Uh, and the, there is a scientific. There have been several papers published. I, I know a couple from Norm Sleep, suggesting that plate tectonics might have occurred on early Mars, and there might have been something like that. But it's there is no consensus agreement on that. It's kind of speculative. The argument against plate tectonics is the obvious one. On Earth, plate tectonics uh, creates a visible features. It creates arc volcanoes. It creates subduction zones. Right? And these are features that are visible from space. On Mars, we don't see arc volcanoes or subduction zones. Uh, we see volcanoes, but they're not arc volcanoes. Not like the Cascades. Right? We see things that are more like uh, the Hawaii volcano, uh, and we don't see anything like subduction zone. It's not that we don't see tectonics. Dallas Marineris is clear evidence of tectonics, but it's not plate tectonics. It's just stretch and wrinkle tectonics. Right? The reason plate tectonics is essential, you can see in Mount St. Helens. It's a graphic illustration that the Juan de Fuca plate is subducting under the North American plate, and all the dead fish piled up on the Juan de Fuca plate get cooked and turn back into CO2 and water and come up in Mount St. Helens to the surprise of the neighbors. Right? That recycling of carbon is essential to maintaining the habitability of the Earth, as was pointed out in a brilliant paper by the three Jims, Jim Castings, Jim Walker, and Jim Pollock, back in the 80s. They pointed out that that is the thermostat that has maintained the habitability of the Earth, the so-called long-term geochemical rock cycle of carbon. And plate tectonics is the mechanism that does that, and Mount St. Helens and the Cascade Range, and even Lassie, are all examples of that activity in, in action. So the, the gases coming out of Lassen and Mount St. Helens and Rainier and all of those are not primordial material from the mantle, they're recycling. That's the recycling system. Right? So uh, without recycling, things die. This is true on planets, it's true in communities, and it'd be true in your own home. Uh, okay, question here.
on, on your <coughs> zero, one infinity scale, um, presumably you're talking more about uh, second genesis, not <coughs> some transplant of early Earth or Mars. Bingo, life, but yes. Maybe it's somewhere in the inner solar system. That's right, that's right, that's right. That's an important point. Uh, if we find life on Mars, we can't assume just because it's on Mars that it's a second genesis. In fact, the bet right now, given what we know, which is not much, but given what we know, the bet right now would have to say if we find on life on Mars, it's likely to be a branch somewhere on here, on our tree of life. They are our neighbors and our cousins. That's the most like, likely case. I'd be personally disappointed if that turned out to be true. I'm hoping for aliens, and the weirder the better, right? That's just what I'm into, you know? <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Something I hadn't uh, canceled on before, but uh, Carl Stoker uh, talked some attention that there's a gravity big, uh, break, rather, on blowing early life out of Mars and Earth into the outer solar system that I thought, heck, when I'm trying to get back to speed stuff, drop spores, rocks all over, war cloud, four yeah. billion years, no problem. It, it should be on the surface of every planet in the solar system, and anything where life would take root, it should be there. And she points out that it takes a heck of a, of a uh, planetary impact to produce a rock covered with bacteria, zooming off from space, fast enough to overcome the sun's gravitational pull, and that might hit it that's correct. If you are looking at Earth or Mars as the source, the chances of polluting or inoculating, to use a neutral term, colonizing the outer solar system decreases as you move out. And in fact, when you get to Enceladus, the chance of something from Earth having reached there, let's go back that slide, the chances of this being contaminated with Earth is, as I'm remembering the numbers, it's like, five orders of magnitude less than the chance of Earth and Mars contaminating each other. Uh, but I just read another, an interesting paper that turned the problem on its head. It said, why do we think life started on Earth or Mars and then spread from there? Where life started was here, in the cooker of Enceladus, and it has an injection mechanism already for spraying it out. And then it just slid into the rest of the solar system. So when we get to Enceladus and find life, we're going to find that it's like the, it is, it is, the universal common ancestor that go back to our tree of life, it will be, Enceladus will be down here below the root. That will be great, great, great grandma there. Uh, that would also be disappointing, by the way. <laughs> Chris, we're going we're gonna to move yeah. on. Yep. Uh, well, thank you very much. <laughs> so there you go, Parks and NASA. And here is Mr. Finero because now we get to hear about Rama. <laughs> we have uh, the board. Whoops, sorry about that.